Hello everybody, this is Dr. Gary Mrozinski from Luzerne County Community College and this is Principles of Economics 2 Microeconomics, Econ 152. This is Chapter 10 and the content from this presentation mostly comes from The Microeconomy Today by Schiller and Gephardt published by McGraw-Hill. This is Chapter 10, Monopoly. What we've just examined is the market structure called pure competition. That is a market where there are hundreds of sellers, maybe even thousands of sellers, and the product is a standardized product, so everybody's product is exactly the same. That is actually a good situation for the consumer. It's an ideal situation. We don't have uh, that many uh, products in our economy that uh, their markets can be considered purely competitive. Agricultural markets, uh, we have examples. Uh, but again, that's where there's many, many sellers. And uh, we're going to now contrast that with the other end of the spectrum. And that's where there's just one seller. So these market structures that we're looking at, uh, last two chapters, this chapter, the next two chapters, what's varying is the level of competition. There could be lots of sellers, there could be few sellers. We looked at uh, one end of the spectrum where there is the most number of sellers, that's pure competition. This is the other end of the spectrum now, uh, opposite that, called monopoly, where there's just one seller. And as you can imagine, this is the worst situation for the consumer. And we're going to look at why that's the case. A monopoly is a uh, product market in which there's just one seller, so there's no competition. The monopolist has significant market power. It has ultimate market power. You can choose the market price. And uh, another, of course, that's bad for the consumer, right? But another uh, shortcoming of this kind of a market is there's no competitive pressure on this seller to innovate. There's going to be a lack of innovation in this kind of a market. There's no competitive pressure to design a better product, to lower operating costs, which would have an effect on the market price, uh, or could in a traditional market that's not monopoly. Uh, but without competition, then there's an absence of this kind of innovation. So in this chapter, we're going to talk about how the monopolist behaves. Just like the other market structures, what we're focusing on is what is the price-quantity combination that uh, maximizes profit for that seller. We're going to do that here as well. What price will the monopolist charge? What is the corresponding quantity that the monopolist will produce? And then are consumers better off or worse off with a monopoly? And I think I already ruined the suspense, but you knew this anyway. The consumer is worse off with a monopoly than if there were more competition. Now, if you recall, with pure competition, the individual seller had a demand curve that was horizontal, perfectly elastic. That's because the market dictates the market price and the individual seller then has no choice but to charge that market price. That makes it a horizontal demand curve. If they charge five cents more per unit than these being standardized products, the consumer, technically speaking, will purchase nothing from that seller. Why would they if they, can, if they have all these other options, all these other sellers selling for five cents less? So they would never do that. They would also never sell for five cents less than the market price because they'd be cheating themselves. If they can sell all that they choose to produce at the market price, then why would they uh, lose profit and sell for five cents less than the market price? So for these reasons, they'll always charge the market price. That was pure competition. And remember where that uh, market price came from was the market supply and demand curve. With pure competition, the market supply and demand curve look like a traditional supply and demand curve. Upward sloping supply that comes from the marginal cost curves of the sellers, if you recall, and a downward sloping, <clears throat> excuse me, demand curve. All right, that is the market supply and demand curve for pure competition. 
Now this is monopoly. The monopolist, if you want to think about the demand curve for the monopolist, the, the monopolist is the market, so the monopolist demand curve is the market demand curve. So it is, on this graph, the solid downward sloping curve. That curve is the market demand curve. That curve is the individual monopolist's demand curve, if you want to think of it that way. So the other thing that we need to address is marginal revenue. With pure competition, marginal revenue was the same thing as the price. That's no longer the case. With uh, any market structure other than pure competition, marginal revenue is not the same as price. Remember, price comes from the demand curve. Uh, so the demand curve for the pure competition, the individual seller, is the same as the marginal revenue curve and vice versa, right? Now we're going to have a separate marginal revenue curve. I'm going to explain to you why mathematically that is the case uh, over the next minute or two. If you don't quite get it, don't panic. It's not a showstopper. Just remember the fact that marginal revenue will always be less than price. So again, price comes from the demand curve. That's the solid downward sloping curve. Marginal revenue at every possible Q, and you can see across the bottom that's Q, right? You could have Q equal to 1, to 2, 3, 4. Actually, uh, after Q equal to 1, marginal revenue is always below the demand curve, below price. Marginal revenue is always less than price. Again, I'm going to explain to you now why mathematically that's the case. And again, this slide is telling you that with pure competition, it's a horizontal demand curve, the individual seller. The monopolist has a downward sloping demand curve. The law of demand applies to the monopolist. If the monopolist wants to sell more, the monopolist has to lower its price. And the only way the monopolist can raise the price is by producing and selling less. The, de the law of demand applies to the monopolist. That's why the individual uh, firm's demand curve is downward sloping. All right, so now back to why is it that marginal revenue is less than marginal price? I've added this little formula at the bottom of the slide here, and I hope this helps, and I hope this doesn't uh, confuse you more than help you. This does not appear in the textbook, but this is the way I am able to keep this straight. All right, let's remember what marginal revenue is. Marginal revenue is the increase in your total revenue if you increase output by, by one, or by some number greater than one, uh, you could do that too. Your total revenue is going to go up. That's why you would do it, right? So say I'm producing 10 per day. Well, that accounts for some amount of total revenue. If I want to increase to 11 per day, then that's going to affect my total revenue, right? How is it going to affect my total revenue? Well, the 11th unit now I'm selling, that accounts for some amount of revenue. But the only way to go from 10 per day to 11 per day is by lowering my price. So that makes it more complicated than just saying the marginal revenue is equal to the price. If I increase from 10 per day to 11 per day, then today I'm selling that 11th unit for whatever the price is, the new price, the new lower price, but I'm also selling the other 10 for a lower price. So I need to account for that. So the marginal revenue is equal to the new price that I'm charging today and P sub nu, that accounts for the revenue that the 11th unit, the new 11th unit I never sold before, is now adding to total revenue. But then I have to remember that I had to cut the price of the other 10. So Q old, in my example, would be 10. And then P old minus new old is the change in the market price. I have to remember that I'm lowering my market price on the other 10 as well today compared to yesterday. Now, uh, again, this without having actual numbers, this might sound a little confusing. So let's go to a table of data, and I'll try to give you an example here. So in this example, you can see the first two columns are the demand schedule. Various quantities, that's the first column, and the prices that would correspond. So if you were to plot that, that would be your demand curve. 
So let's say I'm producing five per day. I'm producing and selling five per day. And I'm selling them at $122. Well, then that gives me total revenue of five times 122 or $610. Now, if I want to begin tomorrow producing six per day, then you could think of an increase in total revenue as including the revenue that that sixth unit is going to account for, and that is true. Uh, but remember that to go from five per day to six per day, I have to lower my price because the law of demand applies to me. The consumers are not going to buy six unless I lower my price from $122 to $112. So I do that. So what is the change in my total revenue? Well, first of all, I'm gaining $112 because I'm selling a sixth unit. But I had to lower the price by $10. So the other five are now selling for $10 less. So it's $112 minus 10 times five. $112 minus $50, which is $62. So slide over to the, let's see, the fourth column, and that's where marginal revenue is. That's where that 62 comes from. So 62, marginal revenue, is less than 112 price marginal revenue will always be less than price unless it's pure competition let's just do one more and then we'll move on if this is giving you a headache don't stress over this I'm just showing you mathematically why it is that marginal revenue is less than price uh, and so let's say you're producing six per day and you're charging $112 so your total revenue is $112 times six that's a six hundred and seventy two dollars all right now, beginning tomorrow, I'm going to produce seven per day and sell seven. I can only do that if I lower my price. My demand curve tells me I'd have to lower my price to $102. I'd have to drop the price by $10. All right, so I do that. Well, what's the change in my total revenue today versus yesterday? All right, well, I'm selling the seventh unit, which I never sold before, for $102. So that's an increase in my total revenue. But again, I had to drop my price by, in this case, $10 on the other six I was selling yesterday. So now I'm selling, uh, compared to yesterday, it's $102 minus 10 times 6, or 60. 102 minus 60 is 42. Now, I'm not selling one unit for $102 and six for $112. I'm selling them all for $102, but I'm comparing today's total revenue to yesterday's total revenue. So again, that's why we have uh, a marginal revenue curve that is downward sloping and below the demand curve where P comes from. If you remember how we graph total revenue, total revenue is P times Q, right? So let's say uh, we're producing three per day, so on the x-axis see the three, and then go vertically and see where that intersects with the demand curve. I'm selling them at $142, all right? If I want to sell four per day, then this is telling me I need to lower my price by $10 from $142 to $132. Well, that's a loss of $10 times three units right after I've changed my price after I've changed my price however I've gained one unit selling for hundred and thirty two dollars so the blue shaded area represents the total gain uh, that the fourth unit accounts for but the red shaded area shows the total loss uh, that's due to lowering the price on the quantity I was selling yesterday which I'm still selling today right So again, market power, what that means is it's as simple as saying control over the price. Pure competition, when you're selling a standardized product and there's hundreds of competitors, you have no control over the price because if you don't charge what the market dictates to be the market price, nobody will buy from you, theoretically, or they don't have to, right? You would never charge more than the market price. Uh, well, market power is when you have some control over it. The monopolist has some control over the market power because they're the only seller. With the other market structures which we haven't gotten to yet, 
What makes them different from pure competition is it's not that they're the only seller, but their product can be differentiated from competitors in some way. That gives them some control over the uh, price they can charge. They can charge a little bit more than other sellers uh, if they want to, if they can convince sellers that their product is superior in some way. Right? That's market power also. Well, the monopolist doesn't have to worry about that because there is no competition. What they do is they'll simply choose the price that corresponds with uh, maximum profit because that's the goal of any of these firms maximizing profit so we're going to go through the analysis now of how the monopolist chooses the price that corresponds with maximum profit now what I'm going to explain uh, looking at that graph is going to apply to the other market structures we haven't gotten to yet also all right this is the way it works this is the monopolists uh, revenue and cost curves now you can see we have the u-shaped average total cost curve which you've learned about in chapter seven and we uh, looked at it in eight and nine as well when we looked at pure competition we have a demand curve that's the solid downward sloping curve that is the market demand curve which is also the monopolists demand curve we have a separate marginal revenue curve that's the downward sloping dash curve which we just saw a couple slides ago All right. there's also a marginal cost curve just as with pure competition and the other market structures there will be a marginal cost curve now for all of the other market structures this being the market uh, graph the marginal cost curve is the supply curve do you remember that the marginal cost curve is the supply curve in a purely competitive market and in the ones we haven't looked at yet either pure uh, oligopoly and monopolistic competition that's not the case here only because the monopolist has no supply curve remember what a supply curve tells you it says that or, or it is it shows you how much sellers will want to bring to market at different possible prices and as the price goes up they'll want to bring greater quantities to market right that's in general what a supply curve is telling you well the monopolist having no competition does not re, uh, does not uh, respond to changes in the market price because they set the market price so what they do instead is they choose the market price that corresponds with maximum in this case industry profits because they're the industry and you remember the profit maximizing rule it applies here it applies everywhere profits are maximized when or at the Q the level of output where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost alright so here's what you do you simply if you have the graph in front of you you simply look for the intersection of marginal revenue marginal cost so marginal cost is that blue up uh, upward sloping uh, curve marginal revenue is the downward sloping dashed curve so point M is that intersection all right you label that on your graph then you drop down vertically to the x-axis and see what Q that corresponds with 475 that's Q max that is the profit maximizing level of output now you extend your dash line vertically uh, up until you intersect with the demand curve because that's where price comes from so what price corresponds with the profit maximizing a level of output 475 the price is and in this case one thousand one hundred dollars so the monopolist will start charging one thousand one hundred dollars it will sell four hundred and seventy five in these are computers or PCs uh, four hundred seventy five computers per month that's where they will experience the maximum profit and remember profit is the quantity P minus uh, P minus average total cost times Q so the shaded area that represents profit then is the difference between price and average total cost so look at that vertical dash line that you drew where does it intersect with the average total cost the u-shaped curve it looks like that's 625 I believe something like that so then profit is 
1,100 minus 625, that quantity times 475. That will be monthly profits. That will be the maximum. That's the largest amount of profit that uh, the monopolist can experience, and that's where we'll, they will choose that price. So it is a myth to believe that the monopolist will charge the highest price they can because they can charge a higher price than $1,100 this, in this example, but profit would be smaller, so they wouldn't do that. So they don't charge the highest profit or on the highest price that they can. What they do instead is charge the price that enables them to maximize their profit. If you recall, in the last chapter, we looked at the PC market, uh, the early days of the PC market, and showed how it evolved into something that was uh, started to approach pure competition, where there were lots of sellers. It was a standardized product. Uh, what we're going to do now in Part B is look at that same market, but imagine that there still are all of those production facilities that were individual sellers uh, previously. Imagine that one company bought them all and then was able to uh, direct them collectively to behave like a monopoly. So they're all under ownership control of one business, one company. Then you can compare pure competition to monopoly. So that's what we're going to do in part B of chapter 10. See you there.